I'm a developmental neurobiologist, and my laboratory is focused on trying to understand how the brain wires up during development. There's a type of cell in the brain called glia, and in particular, there's an immune-like glial cell called microglia. This cell is literally engulfing or eating these extra synapses during development. So if we can better understand how these cells do this job normally, we can potentially identify new therapeutic targets for protecting synapses in these disorders. Great. Thanks so much for this opportunity and for all of you uh, for, for being here today. Um, so, you know, it's becoming increasingly clear that a hallmark of so many disorders, ranging from autism to Alzheimer's, is the loss of synapses, the junction of communication between neurons. And so we, um, the big question in the field and one my lab is addressing is what makes synapses vulnerable in these diseases? Could there be common pathways that mediate the loss of synapses? So we have been largely guided by our studies, our basic science studies in the developing visual system of a mouse. And so today I wanna to tell you about some of this work and, um, and in particular, our focus on the role of both immune-related mechanisms as well as an immune cell called microglia. So um, neural circuits, of course, undergo tremendous remodeling during development. The connections or synapses are constantly forming and breaking in the developing brain. This is over a period of years in human and just a few weeks in mice, but this refinement process is why a child can learn so many languages so easily and why I cannot. Um, so we start off with far more synapses early on in development, but through a process called pruning, there's a large number of these extra synapses that get permanently removed while other synapses get strengthened and maintained. And a major question, of course, is what determines which of these synapses go and which of these synapses stay. Now this refinement process is critical for precise brain wiring. Defects in this process of pruning or refinement are thought to underlie neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and schizophrenia. And indeed, there's evidence that synapses, these little bumps or the synaptic connections or spines on neurons, are lost in disorders like Rett syndrome, schizophrenia. But it's not just developing brain. Also, sadly for us, old brains lose synapses as we age. This normally happens. Uh, and of course, um, it's been best studied in Alzheimer's disease, where it's thought that the loss of synapses happens years before the first sign of pathology, like plaques and tangles. So it's critical that we understand how these synapses are lost, especially as they are thought to happen quite early. So a major question, again, that we're trying to focus on is how are they eliminated? If we could better understand how this normally works, this may provide new insight into potential therapies. Now, many uh, folks in the field in neuroscience study uh, mechanisms that regulate pruning from the context of neurons. Of course, these are the actual cells that are being pruned. But emerging research from our lab and others are implicating another cell, an unexpected cell in this process. And these cells are called microglia. These are a non-neuronal cell in the brain. There are resident immune cells. They make up about 10% of the cells in our brain. And um, essentially, as a developmental neurobiologist, I've completely ignored these cells until very recently. This is in part because um, they're actually the only cell in our brains, not born in the brains. They actually come in, um, they were thought for a long time to come in after birth from a resident peripheral macrophage that sneaks into the brain and then becomes what we call microglia. But we now appreciate that these cells actually enter the brain from the yolk sac, from a different cell, stem cell, get into the brain embryonically, super early. In fact, they're the first glia in the brain. And this completely, in my mind, changed the way we need to be thinking about these cells because they're in the, the right time and the right place to be potentially playing a role in all kinds of aspects of neural development. Now, it's not to say we don't know a lot about these cells. In fact, almost everything we know about microglia is in the context of disease. We know, for example, that they are both good guys and bad guys. They can both protect and harm the brain. They're major contributors to neuroinflammation. They release things that, like cytokines that cause neuroinflammation. But they're also good guys. They're the Pac-Man of the brain. They clear up junk in the brain. Um, they remove toxic proteins like beta amyloid. But as we all know, especially those that have studied pathology, there's a dramatic change that happens in disease where these cells become more phagocytic, more like these Pac-Men, and they, can, they undergo, undergo dramatic changes. But a game changer for me was um, pioneering work a number of years ago 
um, pioneering imaging studies by taking advantage of a reporter mouse line that allowed scientists to actually look in the brains of mice. And what I'm showing you here is actually experiments that we've done um, both in our lab and, and others in the field where you can put a mouse under a microscope. All of their microglia are conveniently labeled with this molecule called GFP, so they're all green. And what I hope you can appreciate from this movie is even in the healthy brain, there's no injury here, how dynamic the processes of these cells are all the time. These cells tile the brain, and they're constantly surveying the brain parenchyma, and they're incredibly motile, okay? So this raised a major question, which is what are they doing in the brain, right? In fact, it's been estimated that the brain, the entire brain can be um, surveyed by these cells because they tile the brain in one hour. So what are they doing? What are they surveying? One of the things we now know that they're surveying are synapses, right? Synapses, now we're overlaying the neuron. These are the bumps or the spines, the actual synaptic connections between neurons. And what I'm showing you is a, an image from my student, Janelle, who's looking in the olfactory bulb of the mouse. And what I hope you can appreciate is how constantly dynamic these cells are. They're constantly touching these synapses. So we started putting these ideas together and we said, well, maybe during development, one of the things they're doing is pruning these extra synapses. They're um, particularly phagocytic. They're more like the Pac-Man stage in our brain during the normal healthy brain. So we wondered, could they be plucking off and literally eating these synapses? So my um, postdoc, Dori Schaefer, uh, tested this hypothesis. And what I'm showing you now is one example of a microglia inside the visual system of a mouse. All of those red and, and blue puncta are synapses. And what she was able to show is almost every microglia we surveyed in the postnatal mouse visual system was chock full of synapses. So they are, in fact, engulfing synapses. And then they stop doing this. So it's a little window during the peak of pruning where they're actually engulfing synapses, but then they stop. And this suggests that this is a tightly regulated process. So a major question, of course, next is how do microglia know which synapse to prune and which one not to prune? This pruning is such a precise process. You wouldn't want them doing this all the time and pruning the wrong synapses or too many synapses. And we know, for example, in this cartoon, that there's actually um, quite a lot of precision in terms of which synapse gets pruned. And it's long known now that the synapses that seem to get pruned, in this case the blue one, is the one that's firing the postsynaptic cell less efficiently. So it's the weaker synapse. So we wondered, could microglia be sensing local cues on, let's say, the blue input, but not the red one? And this brought together a work that I did as a postdoc in Ben Barris's lab, where we unexpectedly discovered the role for a group of immune-related molecules called complement uh, in playing a critical role in this pruning process. So for those of you that are immunologists or remember immunology back in the day, of course, complement cascade used to make my head spin. But here I am spending my entire career studying it, but in a totally different context, in the brain, right? So in the immune system, complement's main role is our, it's our first line of defense against infection, like from a bacterial cell. And it also is important in clearing apoptotic cells and debris. So don't worry so much about the details here, but the, the take home message here is that these secreted immune molecules bind, let's say, to a pathogen. And then, then one of the ways it gets cleared is by the Pac-Man of the immune system, the macrophages that express these receptors called complement receptors. And then that initiates this eating of that cell and it clears it really rapidly. What we discovered was in the healthy developing brain, microglia, also have these receptors, they recognize complement proteins that are tagging or binding to subsets of these immature synapses, and that in fact, this is one way that regulates their engulfment. If you block the receptor on the microglia, or if you blocked um, the proteins, there's a failure to prune properly, and this is sustained throughout, um, throughout life. So it's a major um, process that's regulating pruning normally during development. Now we've learned a lot over the years and much of our effort in my lab is digging into mechanistically how this is working. And we know, for example, this process shuts off in development, which it, which it needs to do. But what if it didn't shut off? What if there was too much pruning going on during development? And that's, in fact, what we're starting to think about into the context of neurodevelopmental disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders like autism and schizophrenia. In fact, emerging work from my lab and from, from uh, collaborators, including Steve McCarroll, implicates this pathway in potentially synaptic wiring defects in autism and schizophrenia using both animal models and some new emerging genetics that implicate complement in schizophrenia. Now, in addition to developmental disorders, our work is also taking us into older brains, where I told you that one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, including, for example, Huntington's disease, is the early last loss of synaptic connections. So we started um, wondering and hypothesizing that perhaps this normal pruning process 
gets aberrantly turned back on again years later, and could this process be actually mediating the loss of synapses in these different diseases? So we started to test this disease in Huntington, uh, this, this hypothesis in Huntington's disease, and I'm gonna share with you just a couple of slides that are suggestive, in fact, that this hypothesis may be correct. Um, you know, Huntington's disease, of course, is a devastating neurodegenerative disease characterized by involuntary uh, motor disorder, dementia, as well as psychiatric and cognitive um, decline. Now, we know that um, this disease is caused by a um, CAG repeat expansion in the gene Huntington, and this leads to this poly Q repeat in the mutant Huntington protein. What is striking about Huntington's, of course, is the regional specificity, the vulnerability of this disease. It affects very preferentially the basal ganglia. You see a huge atrophy of the striatum. But in addition, the gray matter in many patients starts to go, and synapses are lost. And it's been thought that this happens years before you start to see some of the early symptoms. So again, using this model, we asked and tested the hypothesis does complement and microglia-mediated pruning, could this be contributing to the early synapse loss and cognitive impairment in Huntington's disease? And we've been, in, and I should say, leading the charge is Dan Wilton, a postdoc in my lab, in collaboration with uh, CHTI, as well as the Huntington's Disease Society of America, where we've been testing this hypothesis using very well-established mouse models, as well as some human Huntington's tissue. And I'm just gonna share with you just a couple slides, because I'm down to my last minute, I can see, that we see these region-specific upregulation of complement in the vulnerable brain regions of Huntington's mouse models. Again, striatum and motor cortex, but not hippocampus. And in just like development, we see these complement proteins tagging these vulnerable synapses in the Huntington's model very early in the progression of disease. And in addition, much like we see in development, those microglia are all fired up in the striatum very early, and we have some evidence now that they are engulfing those cortical striatal synapses, again, using the Huntington's mouse models. And we now have some human tissue where we're now looking at different grades of Huntington's, and we have some preliminary data that C3, in this case the green puncta, are much higher in Huntington's brain, again, in the vulnerable brain regions, and again, targeting some of those vulnerable synapses. So of course, this leads to the million dollar question, does blocking this pruning pathway reduce or protect the synapses? And so we've been now moving forward and much work in the lab is using this model to see if we can block complement either genetically or pharmacologically or therapeutically to see if we can slow synapse loss and ideally slow the progression of this disease. And we've been using recently a, a novel C1Q blocking antibody that specifically blocks the complement C1Q and downstream complement protein cascade. And this is just my last slide just to show that indeed after one month IP treatment with this antibody in this Huntington's mouse model compared to a control antibody, Dan has already um, had some evidence that there are more synapses in these mice. And now we want to know whether more synapses means slowing the progression of the disease, and that's all ongoing. So the, taken together, this work suggests the possibility that complement and microglia could be novel therapeutic targets, um, and also not just targets, but also the idea that they could also be early biomarkers for not just Huntington's, but other neurodegenerative diseases. Pet ligands have uh, been used and developed that recognize microglia activation, but also um, you know, we can imagine that this has evident, this has potential implications not just in Huntington's, but for all of these diseases, and ranging from Alzheimer's to neurodevelopmental disorders. So much of the work now in the lab is, is aimed to try to test these hypotheses. Thank you very much. I just want to thank a wonderful lab, a lot of collaborators and funding.